we're not going to go through the publication by all details. I'm not talking about stuff I've mastered yet. So in this new publication, the researchers present four different hypotheses and therefore possible gain and loss scenarios on how these urticating hairs have evolved and what are the triggers for it. If you're interested in, make sure you download it. It's still free to download. Uh, in about 30 days, there is a paywall and you have to pay for the article. So if you're interested in, keep on reading, download it on the link below. And it's a fascinating work. They have used transcriptome genetic data, which is far more yeah, comprehensive than the method I used, for example, in my revision of the Psalmopoene subfamily. So that's the future. And in ideal conditions, you would combine it with morphological traits to see how they actually differ from these past morphological only uh, phylogenetic trees. So that's something you should consider reading. And without further ado, we talk about the fact that one of my pictures in the, is in the paper. No, just kidding. But I was able to contribute in a little piece like the picture I showed you already in the video of Pamphogeteus ultramarinus, the picture from a small tarantula from the highlands of Ecuador. And in this case, this small terafosine actually was yeah, flicking hairs at me, but it actually constructed somewhat of a, yeah, I don't know, it, it didn't fire it up, but it looks like all these small urticating hairs with these barbs are connected to each other because the slow process of the spider urticating uh, or flick the hairs was not uh, finished. So I was able to capture a nice shot of this and I'll show you here with the uh, link on the paper itself. So that's how or that's what the topic is all about, um, the urticating hairs. And if we now go about the video title and the genus of Ephibopus, it comes clear that Ephibopus has a special place. You can clearly see it uh, in this paper already in the phylogenetic tree around here. There is the blue marking with the type 5 hair and it's within the subfamily of Psalmopoene and all other members of this subfamily like Topinogenius, Psalmopoeus, don't have any urticating hairs. So that's quite a scenario on why this tarantula genus classified in another subfamily and now also multiple times uh, actually confirmed that it is in a different subfamily with on a genetic uh, databases. So it's not only morphological categorized based on uh, bulb morphology and tibioapophysis morphology, but also on uh, yeah, DNA level. And therefore, it's very interesting to see that it is in this subfamily. So the genus Ephibopus has a very special placement of its urticating hairs. Um, it's placed on their pedipalps and therefore it's not on the abdomen, such as in other New World tarantulas, uh, ground-dwelling tarantulas, or also the arboreal ones like Avicularia or Caribena. So therefore very special and it flick hairs quite differently because it does not flick it from the abdomen, but more from the pedipalps and therefore is able to, as adult specimens, when they live in their uh, turrets on the ground, they can flick hairs at the predator or at the invader directly uh, looking at them. So that's a unique feature among all the tarantulas out there. Until now, there is no other uh, genus or, or one of these five species within the genus which has this feature. And if we compare it to other genera, then it comes clear that it also has a very, very special lifestyle because as small spiderlings, they tend to live arboreal. So they construct a silk retreat, just like Avicularia in the wild or in the field and also in captivity. So that's something I want to show you right now. This enclosure right here has live plants in it, even though it's quite small. And you can see clearly on the top upper right corner, there was the initial retreat the spider built once I put it in there. So it behaved just like any other Avicularia, even though it's now classified in a completely different subfamily. But that's the case after the second molt, they try or start to dig their burrows, just like the adult ones. So after the second or third molt, they prefer to live fossorial until they die somewhat in around 10 years. 
Uh, that's the preferred lifestyle and that's the preferred lifestyle uh, you're also going to find when you look for them in, in nature. So another picture here from a wild specimen which uh, Rito found in Suriname. Actually, we've been there together, but sadly we did not find any Ephibopus. Probably they were collected a few weeks ago once we were there, so we were in bad luck. But anyway, switching to the other enclosure, we are now looking at the entrance and maybe we are able to feed it. So just let's grab a cricket and uh, yeah, have a little wait. Yeah, as you can see, it's very quick. These spiders are extremely fast. They're not perfectly suitable for beginners because they're basically pet holes, just like most of the tarantulas. You're not going to see them very often, but when you see them, Ephibopus cyanognathus with its blue fangs, it's just remarkable looking and with his special lifestyle, with special abilities to flick hairs at you while looking at you, not unlike other tarantulas, it's just remarkable. But uh, that's for that. If you keep them, make sure you have a high humidity environment, good ventilation, and also a good amount of substrate. You've already seen it in these little clips I inserted here. But back again to the paper and publication, the sole video, was about this publication. It's very important. It's great to have so many people working on these tarantulas we all love and all keep as pets and like to observe in the wild if possible. But uh, it's great to see so many people working together and yeah, in the end, publish a paper like this with uh, new hypotheses, new theories, and most of all, new methods used so they don't rely on older methods um, but actually work on yeah using new methods already used in other fields but in this case primarily used in the world of tarantula research so that's a great point and that's also the end of the video it shouldn't be that long i hope and for the next one, we will cover probably one of the Scolopendra again, because apparently you really liked it. And also there are new field trips coming in this year. So if you are here only to observe tarantulas in the wild through this channel, don't get mad. We have to cover some things from the captivity as well, because that's basically also the things uh, which interest me uh, very much. But in the end, we all hope to see more tarantulas in the wild. And that's something we are going to do for sure this year. So there will be some videos coming, uh, hopefully with tarantulas in them. As you know, it's always uh, yeah, hard work to see some and a lot of luck involved. So thanks for that. Uh, thanks for watching. See you guys next week.